right? It's like the good, the bad, and no, that's and the ugly. Yeah. <laughs> um, the worst and the best. The worst and the best. And Eliza, you're, are you going to come up, Eliza? Come on down. Come on down, Connie. Oh yes. It's coming sir. down, Kia. We've got a Jody. Um, so um, the worst and the best stories. Uh, and remember, panel, you are being broadcast nationally. <laughs> oh, thank you. The worst and the best, tall tales of production and experiences, and why and what you learned, moderated by Eliza Bent. So, uh, without further ado. Hello. If a play fails in a forest, does the audience hear it clapping? <laughs> ah. So that was helpful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think we. Well, let's hear the tales. Okay, I want. I want to go first. Uh, Siri, set an alarm for 15 minutes from now. Siri, wake up, you bitch. Wait, okay, she's not going to do it. Um, I'm sorry, that was terribly sexist. Okay, well, you'll... Let's hear it, Connie. Okay, so, uh, the public theater, my play, Dog Opera. I wrote this play about the friendship uh, I, I have with Greg Lemming, who is also a director. Um, <clears throat> at the same time that I had finished it, uh, the public theater uh, under Joanne Acolytus had decided to give me the Mellon Grant. And then there was a big coup and Joanne was fired and then George Wolf came in and uh, the only way to get the money for the Mellon Grant was to turn that play in. So I turned the play in, George called me and he said, I want to start the season with this play. And I said, George, that's fantastic. Um, and I would like Greg Lemming to direct it. And he goes, who? And I said, my friend Greg Lemming, who's a director, a real director. And uh, he said, okay, uh, we'll talk. So what happened is they turned Greg down, and I got pissed off. And I said, well, then you better get me an A director, A list director. So they gave me someone I will now call the very crazy Jerry Gutierrez. Uh, Jerry Gutierrez had just won a Tony with uh, Cherry Jones in the, in the heiress, and uh, he just survived cancer surgery, and he was ready to go back to work, and then I found out later he wanted to do a downtown show. So somehow, <laughs> later. Anyway, <clears throat> so George said, uh, well, I think you should meet him. So Jerry called me in the evening. He was loaded, but he was very kind of perky. Loaded and, with money or something else? Loose or s s s something else. <laughs> and um, he kept saying, I love your play. I love your play. You know, if that happens, just it's, it's an alarm button that you should. Um, so he said, meet me at Orso. So I went to Orso and I'd never been there. And once I got in, I realized I would never be able to afford anything in this upscale restaurant. And he had this bag with him. And he said, uh, in the bag is my companion. I can't tell you her name, because if we say her name, she'll sit up and will be kicked out. Uh, she's a dog. So um, we went into rehearsal and uh, we cast it. That was a little shaky, but I got Christine Nielsen, so I was, I was happy about that. Um, and then Jerry had this concept, which was, instead of using any props, he was going to use sound effects all up Lily Tomlin's wonderful show, The Signs of Intelligent Life, that, you know. And, um, and even then I thought, well, that'll be okay, uh, not realizing that it was going to suck up rehearsal, takes so much time. So we, we started working on it, and it did take an enormous amount of time because we didn't have the sound design yet. Because the public theater was completely disorganized, 
Everybody was gone. I never saw George. Um, I, George actually never saw the play all the way through. He only saw one act. I didn't see either of the dramaturgs, friends of mine. Um, and I didn't see Rosemary. The, uh, so I, I saw nobody. So we were just out there kind of. Uh, and it sounds like it was pretty challenging. What what did you learn? <laughs> is, is, is my time up yet? I just want to give fair, you know. I I'm kind of because I figured everybody gets fifteen minutes, so I. Oh, oh oh oh. Yeah. So. All right. Uh, so uh, so what happened is uh, they hadn't hired the sound designer, so Jerry called a work stoppage, and uh, the actors went with him, and they just left. Uh, so the time kept ticking. Finally, somebody hired the sound designer he wanted, and then we went back into this interminable tech, which took up most of the 23 performances that the play was supposed to have. Uh, it finally opened. By the time it opened, Jerry had resigned, and um, but the actor stuck with it. God bless them. And on opening night, I was at the party, and I was like, where is everybody? I went out into the lobby, and there was George and Morgan and Rosemary, uh, and they all had the New York Times, and they were reading it, and they wouldn't give it to me. Oh. So my friend Helen Sheehy went out into the street, bought me a New York Times, came back in, we opened it, and it was a rave. The first money and only money review I'd ever gotten. And at that point, if Joe Papp had been alive, live, he would have extended the play at that point. Um, <clears throat> but that didn't happen. And uh, since they had a subscription audience, which I hate, uh, they would say it was sold out and there'd still be empty seats. And it was unbelievably traumatic. So Christine Nielsen won an Obie, and we went to the Obie Awards, which was on Monday. And the Love, Valor, Compassion guys came over, Terrence McNally's, and they're like, we can't wait to see your play. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, it closed on, on Sunday. And they were like, what? And uh, yeah, so it took me a while to get, get over that. All right, that's my story. Well, what did I no, learn? I'm just, I'm, this is a fascinating story that you have this raid, but it was traumatic. If you, what would you, would you have done anything differently or what? What did you learn from it, or what, 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 did what I wisdom learn? can you... I, I can say that as a playwright, I didn't realize I had more power than I did. I thought all I could do was pull the play, but I couldn't pull the play because the public owned it because of the Mellon grant. Uh, I could have gone to George if I'd been able to find him as the producer and go, what the fuck? Uh, I, my agent was not... I was a nice girl. And I'm a team player, I work for a theater, and I was like, okay, well, this is where I'm gonna get this done. And uh, I've never been a brat. I've never been, you know, one of those people that storms out of rehearsals or anything. And uh, so I didn't do anything. So I got run over front, and then they backed over me. Um, and then what, Jerry died the next year, and my agent at William Morris called and said, well, you know, Jerry, Jerry died. I bet you had a lot to say. And I said, I think it's tragic. I, oh, that's terrible. And, and he choked. Oh, he was eating something, and he had some teeth missing because of the surgery, knowing that what William Morris wanted me to say was he finally choked on his own ego. I knew that was my line, but I wasn't going to do that because it's icky. Um, so what did I learn? You need to think about yourself and not be so much of a team player. That's what I learned. Okay, the end. <laughs> Thanks, Connie. <laughs> Kia, you're up at the back. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I'll remember this in such detail. You probably know this because I probably told you many of my funny stories, but it's kind of funny now, it wasn't funny then. So this was a long time ago, and it was an off-Broadway theater in New York, and uh, and I gave, I did this production, and there was this person that people had said good things about who was 
had just come out of Yale, actually, so it was like her first big job, but she was older. She wasn't a Yale. She was like 40 and had just come out of Yale. And it got, she got her recommended, and we met, and, uh, and uh, uh, I, really quickly, she turned out to be nuts, and so, and is in volatile, and apparently that was also a descriptive word that no one told me before I worked with her. And uh, I want to try to cut to the chase because she actually, I mean, uh, we had a, a stage manager that was highly recommended and she didn't know why she kept making these mistakes. She was making these terrible mistakes. And of course, in retrospect, I realized because she yelled at her and screamed at her all the time. She screamed at the tech people. She screamed at me in front of the tech people. I mean, the only people she didn't scream at were the uh, actors except one of them, which was one of the leads, and it was like, so there was tension all the time. So anyway, the, the story, the, to get more specific, is uh, for some reason, this does not, I mean, this seems crazy now, how did this work out? But I swear, we went 13 days without a day off. That doesn't seem equity possible, but I swear that happened. We went from the tech to the dress rehearsal to the first previews, and she, so, so this was the 12th of the 13 days, it was Saturday night, and we were all so exhausted. And the director looked like she had, you know, like, you know, dark circles down to her belly. So, um, so anyway, we, uh, so we, it was afterwards, and it was just me and the director and the assistant director, who now is um, a pretty uh, prominent playwright. Jenny Schwartz was my assistant director because she was thinking of being a director then and now she's a playwright. But uh, but anyway, everything else had gotten dark and also this friend of hers from Yale who had come right out of Yale and was now a literary manager um, first said something to me that I remember I found irritating and I just sort of like was like really chilly with her and then even though it was like friendly but friendly in a condescending way. And then she starts talking to this woman like, oh, like for an hour she's telling her stuff. And I was thinking, oh my God, she's going to be fun. I should say one other, just a little thing before. She told, okay, here's just a little detail because I guess I'd be a little vague about her oddness. So the first day of rehearsal, she told the cast, she didn't really like plays. And um, oh. it was kind of her way of saying how special this was that she deigned to direct it, but I didn't take that as a helpful comment. <laughs> and then she said she said she liked films and 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 her herbal business that she was starting. And one day, one day I went to this play with her, I was trying to be friendly, and she had this little vial of something or other, it was some herb, and she said, um, and I asked her, oh, what is that? And she said whatever it was, uh, and she's, I forgot the name of it, but then she said um, it helps to keep me calm. And I remember oh. thinking, you better be drinking that by my gallon. <laughs> so, so anyway, so this night when she's, uh, after it, the theater's dark, everybody's gone, we're all tired, and it's time to give notes. And, um, and so we sat down, she and I, the assistant director, and um, and I said, why don't we wait till tomorrow morning when we're all rested? And she said, give the notes to me now. And she has her coat on and her purse. And um, so I, a couple of times I said, we should wait till tomorrow. She said, give them to me now. And so I'm, not, I'm really not exaggerating too much with it. I mean, she was. <laughs> and I got, so I started to give her the notes. And I got to about the sixth note. And... She was just sitting there with her arms crossed, glaring at me this whole time, and her coat on. And I finally said, why don't we wait till tomorrow? And she said, give them to me now. And I said, well, you're not writing any of them down. <laughs> she flipped out. She said, I have not been there enough. I deserve, I do deserve to give her any notes because I have not been in there in rehearsal enough. I missed like a day and a half of rehearsal, and I was in a... I was at the 10 out of 12, 10 out of 12, 8 out of 10, and half of the second 8 out of 10 the tech. And she said, I did not deserve, I was not around enough to deserve to give her any notes. And she was like flipping out so much, and the assistant director's looking freaked out. And, and I finally said, all right, and I just started walking away, because she was like so crazy. And she's, it was just, it was just made no sense to even discuss it. 
And she said, oh, Kia, come back and act like a woman for once in your life. What? <laughs> <laughs> In my life where I felt like I was always running away from a fight. So she like hit me right where I am, right? <laughs> so I came back and she sort of like give me this whole lecture, right? I remember telling a friend later about this whole thing and she said, Kia, did she know you before? And I said, no. And she said, then how did she know you've never acted like a woman ever in your life? I said, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> what I learned was not to work with her again. <laughs> Beware of herbalists. <laughs> down to the belly. <laughs> but I'm not sure what else, because I actually feel like... When you spun mom, around, and then, like, so she said, don't walk away, be a woman, and then what happened? You came back? Then and I came back with my arms crossed, and she went into a long lecture just screaming at me for the next several minutes. <laughs> but I don't know how much I learned other than... Uh, <laughs> I, because I feel like I did the best I could under the circumstances mm -hmm. in a way. I mean, there were tricky circumstances early on, so I could have fired her, and I didn't, I didn't want to. I thought the scramble for somebody else would be really difficult. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I learned that situations like that make excellent anecdotes. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly do. <laughs> And really, we're not like bad mouthing here, right? Like this is about learning, right? And hopefully, to there's of course great, wonderful specificity in these um, uh, nefarious tales at times, but um, you have to learn by that by doing, right? By the productions. Yeah. Can, can, <laughs> can you learn this stuff in school? Uh, anyway, these are philosophical questions. Jody, let's hear your. I believe you had two. I have two on the uh, my, my, my first one uh, is, um, I've never spoken about this in public, but so I, I have to leave out a lot of names, probably including my own. Um, uh, once upon a time, I was directing a show um, by my friend Neil Bell, I can name him, um, at the Mark Taper Forum. And, um, for those of you, at least, I'm sure this is probably still true, and it was certainly true then, it was very difficult to cast men in their 40s or 50s in a play, um, because most of them were working in film or television. Uh, and anyway, so I was um, very young, and um, I was, I can't say I was simply persuaded, I also chose, I made a decision to hire an actor who had been very successful in television, and wanted to do the role, and um, and so we cast them, and um, and then we began rehearsing, and um, some strange things started happening. Like um, he couldn't go longer than fifteen seconds without stopping. Um, he couldn't remember his lines. He couldn't remember any blocking. Uh, he would turn to us, me and Neil, and ask strange questions in the middle of a run through. This was, these were, and this sort of piling up, and we sort of looked at each other at one point and said, you know, this is just not going to work. And we, tr I tried everything to try to talk him through it, help him, etc. Um, but it, 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 for whatever reason, and you never know exactly what it is. Maybe the role presents particular challenges, or someone's been working in television too long to face something that requires sustained um, acting. Um, and so uh, we had to fire him. I had to fire him. And so I fired him. And, um, and then something wonderful happened. Suddenly, Mike McGuire, who won a Tony for the championship season, appeared. And he took over the role, and he was great. So it's actually a really happy story. <laughs> and probably when we were casting, he wasn't available. He was, I know that was true. And then he was available, and he was awesome. One of the best actors I ever worked with, and um, he just and, and he was so good that what can sometimes happen if you do have to fire an actor in a company, it creates a, a kind of um, earthquake through the company. It can be very, very negative and difficult for other actors to deal with because they begin to have fear, and everybody sort of 
can get upset, but that never happened with this company, and I think it was largely due to um, Mr. McGuire, so I was really grateful. And what's the lesson from that? Well, um, everything in its own time. And, and be careful, you know, the other thing I learned, and this took me some time, was, you know, be patient with casting. You know, don't, just, just hang in there. Something will, will give way, and you don't, you can, as long as you can learn to be patient. That was something I had to learn. Uh, the other story is just, a, you know, I can tell fairly quickly, I think, is um, I, uh, had, uh, I, I was, had been working for two years on a production of an adaptation of Mao Tu um, with Fred Newman and then Nora Ferguson and Clay Taliaferro, and, um, and then the cast was filled out with students, and I had uh, a big grant from the university to um, purchase a lot of um, equipment to do basically was a video triptych was part of the production and uh, this was um, a Sunday before we opened on Thursday and I remember we were in the green room I was talking to my tech people we were just having coffee or something that morning before we went back into tech and everybody was at suddenly was someone came into the room Doug Marlon and he was acting kind of strange and uh, I said what's going on and uh, he said, um, you better go into the theater. I said, okay. So I went into the theater, and it was stripped bare. There was nothing there. Someone had come in and stolen $80,000 worth of equipment, basically. Ah. With the entire build of the video um, production of the show, it was all, you know, everything was saved there. Uh, this was in 02, so it's not like it is now where everybody has, you know, much more readily available um, storage. Anyway, and then it turned out, and I would, I couldn't believe it. I've, I've never had. It was the most, one of the most shocking. It was like the Grinch or something, you know, where you go and it's like, uh, and the Grinch turned out to be two. There were three Grinches, two uh, Duke students and one student from University of Maryland, and they had, um, and all this. And the moral of this story, by the way, is make sure your doors are locked. <laughs> that, 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 that's the moral. The door was locked, but there was like not a panel in front of the deadbolt, so they somehow managed to uh, uh, get into the theater, steal everything. But what they didn't know is that there were cameras everywhere. So we actually had them on film. Now, and so eventually they were apprehended, right? Um, but in Maryland, now obviously this isn't going to help me. I got a show opening on Thursday, and um, Don DeLillo is going to be there. And, uh, uh, you know, th 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 there's nothing in the theater. And so uh, I had some great people working with me, and they rebuilt the video. And I think they probably stayed up for, you know, 48 hours doing it. But they were awesome, and, it, and, it, and they took care of it. But it was, you know, the kind of last-minute psychotic event that it was just insane. <laughs> anyway, there's my story. Yeah, no, that is... Insane. Um, I wonder, like, in thinking about these things you learn through trying experiences, um, what about moments, have there been moments in your uh, experience where a budgetary constraint, uh, perhaps one that was already known, or a surprise budgetary constraint prompted some sort of unique design solution or uh, Happy surprise? Wow, so many times. Really, really so many times. Yeah. I, I don't, I mean. Any particular? <laughs> <laughs> Any ones you want to talk about? Um, hmm. Let somebody take this. <laughs> There's all, all, always some budget constraints, and so the, uh, the 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 working, the you know, the designers and the director, and I, you know, come up with solutions, particularly the designers, and uh, I, I'm, I always like it better, you know. I don't. It's like okay, that's gone. Good. You don't need it. I have become sort of an advocate for bare stage, uh, perhaps because of the world I came up in, 
with wonderful designers, but then more and more I, I just felt like I saw a lot of shows that I thought were hurt by a design that had done all the work of the play. Actually, it happened fairly recently uh, with the production of Eurydice, where uh, I sat, was sitting with uh, Sarah Rule, and we came in and we sat down and she said, okay, the play is over. This is an installation that says everything the play says. But, you know, being the minch that she is, she was lovely, and, you know, it was, it was a labor of love on the part of the people. Sometimes I think maybe people who say, I love your play, should just be fired. You know, it worries me. I, I'd rather have somebody go, okay, let's, uh, let's work on this, you know, rather than keep the love out of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> alcoholic yet, so. <laughs> Budgetary wows. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of any specific, I mean, I worked with some brilliant designers that did plenty with theaters always so limited, and so, yeah. uh, so, you know, I definitely have brilliant design stories, but uh, I don't know that I necessarily expected that there would be like, you know, it's different than I expected. I just love yeah. what they come up with, with, you know, with so little. Well, I wonder too, like uh, rehearsal mishaps or like a workshop that went sort of askew that maybe then resulted in learning, oh gee, we don't need those two actors. We need one actor to do those parts. <laughs> I'm sure the actors are really happy with that. <laughs> well, I know that's never happened. That's no, no. We need all of our actors. I'm lying. Of course, I'm lying. <laughs> I wish we could be. I could tell you about a fantastic production experience. Great. Um, it was. Uh, First play I did at the Children's Theater of Minneapolis, and it was Raggedy Ann and Andy, uh, and a lot of it was original on my part, um, and they did it. I mean, the way Children's Theater in Minneapolis did, just gorgeous, just, and there were two worlds. There was the, the doll world, which was scaled to the actors playing dolls, and then there was the human world. So there was a bassinet that was huge in one scene because that's where the one with the dolls and then it was normal size in the human scene. There were so many wonderful moments but I think this is the one that got me. Uh, I had been away and they had started tech so I came into tech and Jimmy Ingalls, I don't know if you know him, he's a brilliant lighting designer, was lighting it and he said, oh Connie, oh Connie, Okay, I want you to see this cue. Uh, this is the reason I went into theater, is for moments like this. So I sat down, and they started it, and what's supposed to happen is this baby has been born, and it's just a bassinet that glows. And then uh, I had asked for a zillion stars come in the, a zillion fairies come in the window, and then a large sort of angel fairy comes over the bassinet and sings the song. It was just a very simple little poem, a blessing on uh, a child and all babies. Um, and then that goes away and the lights come up on the human uh, scale. And there was the sister who had trouble with the birth of the baby and she had the fairy puppet and she was entertaining him with it. So that was the, it, you know, I actually, I asked for a zillion uh, fairies to come through the window. The rest was pure design, and it was absolutely gorgeous. But so after we ran the queue, I mean, I just couldn't even speak, and I looked over at Jim Ingalls, and he put his head down on the tech table and was sobbing. 
you know, and I said, Jimmy, this is, you know, this is why we went into theater. This is just never going to be more beautiful than that. And, you know, to, to an extent, that is really true. There was an incredible, Craig Wright played a, uh, you know, a rock in the show. And uh, <laughs> he played a, a, a fire hydrant that peed in this show. Um, it, it just was, it was gorgeous. Just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I, I, I can share another tech story, I guess. Uh, when uh, my play, Breath Womb, uh, premiered, at the Royal Court in London, and uh, the, there's a part where sh the main character does a fireworks show, and I, which I've seen it done a few times, but that first time was the best. And there were some things they did with fiber optics, which are kind of, you know, it was cool, it's kind of an obvious uh, choice, but it, it works really well. Um, but the coolest thing, well, I should say there are 10 actors in that play, and there were four in the scene, and it's in the park when they do the fireworks. So what they did was they took the other six actors, and they were just dressed in black, and they came out to make the fireworks. And one of the coolest things was the lighting designer did this thing where, I forgot what this was called, but it was like glitter, except I think maybe the pieces were slightly bigger. I forgot what it was called. But she had those actors in black, uh, take it, take this stuff, and with a straw, blow it through these lights, and um, it felt like fireworks were showering out of their mouths. And it was so magical, like so much more magical than if there were real fireworks, actually. It was so theatrical. So, like there's an example where I, um, which actually I love to do that with designers, to do something that's completely challenging and seems impossible on the stage. And the way they can make it possible can be so magical. Can I add something about the, the fairies coming in through the window? Um, I was sitting at opening night, and this little girl was sitting on her grandfather's lap. And when the zillion fairies came in this huge window, she said, she said, Grandpa, are those real fairies or doll fairies? So, and what they had done was, they, you know what a bobbinet is? Um, it's, a, it's a scrim that's solid. Uh, the children's theater had made all these reticulated fairies, and they were sewn on the bobbinet. So when it came down, and they had all these specials on the side, the, they would turn, and it looked like a zillion fairies coming in through the window. Oh my god, I love that production. It was just fantastic. <laughs> well, now that we're in this lovely, fairy, glittery, <laughs> magical state of... Oh, um, I wonder if we could open it up to hear some, some other tall tales of things learned. Uh, I saw a hand go up in the back. Right, you well, ready? Yeah, or questions, or we, it's, the stage is ours. Judy actually kind of did touch on this, but um, maybe Kia and Connie want to add, or Judy, if you think of other things to add, but I'm really fascinated especially as a new playwright in this, the idea of vetoing versus choice in casting. And we're always told that we have veto power, not necessarily choice power. And um, I've been really fortunate in the readings and production I've had that I've, I've loved every cast I've had, but I'm wondering if you guys have ever had to use that veto power of, of like, this person's just not right for the role. And, and if you've had to use that, how did you do it in a way that was tasteful and respectful and that you and that you were able to keep a good relationship with the theater and the director and, and the actors and whatnot. I've never been forced to use an, uh, to, to hire an actor. It's always for the world premiere, I've always been a part of it. And if it's a, a bigger cast, sometimes uh, the director and I will negotiate a bit, like you can have this person and I'll have this person, but I, uh, uh, that's not to say that a few times I haven't made mistakes, but they've been my mistakes. That production I was talking about was actually a rep in rep. So it was um, uh, com complex when you have a rep situation because there are always trade-offs. And um, uh, so, you know, sometimes you got to trade off. Um, and you, you might not get your top choice, uh, 
but you know, hopefully you can at least negotiate to have somebody you can work with, you know. My experience is that I've objected but discovered that the veto power actually, I really didn't have it. The only power I had was the a power to pull the play. And uh, I, I tried to do that once, and I was wrong, actually. Um, and it was this production of From Icons in Los Angeles at the Matrix uh, Theater. Joe Stern was producing it. And uh, the first production, um, this really lovely guy totally misinterpreted the play. And if you know that play, there's a moment where Evelyn crosses and goes, where is God? Where is God? Where is God? Where is he? Where is he? Where is God? Where is God? And she goes off, and then Jim comes in and goes, did your mother come through there, through here? And Kathy says, yes. And he said, how did she seem? And Kathy says, better. So that's the scene. So what actually happened was the woman comes on, and she's like, where is God? Where is God? Where is he? Where is God? Where is God? Where is God? And she exited. And you know, the play was over at that point. It, there was no, nothing funny. There was something relentless. So, and the actors knew that something was up. So I hated this production and I thought, so the only thing I could do was pull the play. And I was going to pull the play, and then Joe Stern met with me, and he said, I'm going to give you a new production. To my mind, it's about a kitchen table and three chairs and the actors. Awesome. He got Chris Tabori to direct it, Christopher Tabori, and uh, that's the play they did, and I saw. It was absolutely beautiful, completely simple, and, uh, you know, all of the stuff they needed could be done with those kitchen chairs. And it, it won a Drama League Award. It, it just, that was an incredible experience. Luckily, Joe Stern pulled me off the ceiling and got me calmed down. That's the one time where I wasn't a nice girl. And you know what? I was wrong. So I wasn't rewarded. But I was rewarded with a really good production. I had a casting experience once uh, where, uh, somewhat similarly to the repertory uh, mm -hmm. challenges, um, it was a production at a school, and um, there was some recommendation of who we should cast as a to play an older gentleman. Uh, we needed somebody in, in his sixties, and it turned out that he that the actor we had couldn't. Um, well, he quit the day before we were supposed to start rehearsals. And so, and because it was tricky, I ended up being the older uh, man in the play. <laughs> and I've been doing it since, gosh darn it. So, so I learned the rest is history. The rest is plane on a plane. Um, other questions? Or, um, yeah, yeah, I have a story to tell. Great. Like Biggie Smalls, I have a story to tell. Uh, uh, that's if Mark and Mary Beth don't mind. Same train, same train story. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, um, Mark and Mary Beth Easley and I collaborated on a play called Same Train. I wrote the, the stories, their poetic monologues, and Mark um, wrote the music to them, and Mary Beth directed. And we had this project in development for a number of years, a number of readings, and we finally got our first. Uh, production. This is back in 2004 at uh, theater in New York City, off off Broadway, and um, we were in rehearsal with actors that we had been working with. And uh, midway through the rehearsal process, there was a there was artistic differences between the the producers and uh, myself, Mary Beth, and Mark. And um, so uh, after a series of events in you know, making a long story very short. Uh, they decided, we decided to step uh, to part ways. Well, two days or three days later, we get a phone call from one of the actors telling us that they were gonna do the play anyway. And 
that because I had option, they had option to play, it was theirs and not mine, and they could do whatever they wanted to do with it. And so they proceeded to um, rehearse the play with intentions on opening it with a new director, a new musical, um, um, uh, uh, what am I saying? A new musical comp composer, and without me, it, I could not come to the play, I could not collaborate on it or anything. So, um, needless to say, I was a bit heated, and Mary Beth was heated, and, and Mark was heated, and um, you know, my, my agent who told me not to get involved with these people anyway, and my agent, Joan Scott, you think Barbara Walters and you got her. And, and when I called her, she said, Lee, Lee, it's about those people, isn't it? You know? <laughs> I told you not to do that, but. And, um, and you know, I, I'm, I'm from Harlem, USA, born and raised, I wear it on my chest like a badge. Because some of the people up there, well, a lot of the people up there who uh, I grew up with and everything, they support me. They come and see my plays and stuff. So, um, I'm not up there all the time these days, but anyway, during that time, I went uptown and um, one of my guys, this guy Country, he saw me and he comes to my place, you know, he's a street guy, you know, yo Lee, man, he was like, um, when am I going to come see your next play? And I said, yo Country, you're not going to believe this, and I told him the story, and he was like, word? <laughs> he said, they stole your play? He said, you know these people? I said, yeah. He said, Lee. He said, you know they could fall hard on the ice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can come and spray the stage if you need us to. And I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do it a legal way. So long, <laughs> so, long story short, um, Mark's dad, um, my, my agent got a, an attorney, and Mark's dad got another attorney. And we had to march into a room and sit down for a day to get our play back from these people that actually stole our play. So, anyway, that's it. And paid to get that. Yeah. Um, I would just say to the playwrights, um, there's a gauge between, and you have to gauge, sometimes people are either limited in imagination or energy. Who are working on your production, you're going to come across it, and um, whether or not and how much you can do about it uh, is tricky, but it's not fair to have your production limited because somebody is in a life space where their energy is a little bit limited. It's not fair to have your production limited because somebody's imagination is not large enough to see what you've written. Um, it helps to have a great director to, to negotiate that with, but sometimes it's not there. And again, you have to be very diplomatic about how you go about framing things to get that person's energy behind you and to do what needs to be done. But um, it's a battle worth being fought, um, obviously, because it's your production. But that, that is a trick. And you'll, you'll not, I don't think you'll almost, it's a really rare and great situation where you walk in and everybody working on the production is working to exceptional standards that will match, you know, what needs to be done. So um, sussing that out is, is a challenge. And then finding an ally, hopefully with your director, to, to get everybody to working up to that speed. I've had... I've been in situations of playwright where they say, well, we, we can't do this, we can't, the universe can't appear on, this, on the ceiling of the theater. And I've said, well, actually I know three different ways that we can do that and I'm happy to get on a, I'll get on a ladder, give me the keys, I'll lock up when I'm done, you know. And um, so people will tell you, well, we can't do this. And, you know, sometimes you just have to push a little bit further. Um, I have just a brief addenda. There's this organization called the Dramatist Guild, and they have yearly, uh, you know, uh, you have to pay, I don't know, $150 a year. Totally worth it. Uh, our beloved Doug Wright wrote this musical called Hand on the Hard Body. Um, 
and it was done, uh, it went to a theater in Texas, and one of his collaborators saw it, and she said, you would not believe, this is unrecognizable. They moved scenes around, they just did whatever they wanted to with it. So Doug called the Dramatist Guild. Rather than call his agent, he called the Dramatist Guild, and they shut it down. So it's, um, and that was a bridge that Doug was willing to burn because that wasn't his play, you know? So that's, it's just, they also have a standard contract. They have free legal advice. Uh, yeah. So I think we're at time. Yeah. Sorry. So remember to lock the doors. <laughs> Be patient with casting. Stand up for your playwrights. <laughs> Thank you.